to introduce Susan McCaslin to you. Those of you who have long memories will remember she read for Poetry London some years ago. And I had read her but not met her, so in order to meet her, I organized an interview with her for Gathering Voices, and my first question was to her, are you a Gnostic? And I don't think we've ever had the answer. Tonight, we might just have the answer. Maybe in the trails of exhaust. Um, Susan's latest book is The Disarmed Heart. And we have, I would really like to welcome as well, the publisher of both the books and the poets who are being fetid tonight, and that is David Kent, who's driven them up from Toronto. So big. And uh, if I could only read what is written here, the light, beware Susan, the light is not a good. Um, but I did write a, a very nice commentary blurb for Susan's book, which I cannot read here. So maybe, Susan, you can read it for people. Um, ah, it's on this page. I'll leave this page for you. It's on the website, good. And it's a gorgeous, it's a, uh, David, you've done a gorgeous production of both the books. They're elegantly done. Um, is there any way of getting more light here? Aha. Uh -huh. Clever, clever Stan. Sorry, I forgot. I don't know how you did it, Lee. I guess I So, welcome Susan McCaslin. She is nourished by the wilderness and by the world's mystical traditions. She lives in Fort Langley, British Columbia with her husband Mark Haddock. And um, recently she initiated the Han Shan Poetry Project, was, which was, as compared to certain Woodlot poetry projects here in London, it was a success. So she saved a great, she and her friends and poets whom she brought to, um, together. We, they, say this woodlot, and it is now in perpetuity, um, uh, rescued from uh, development. She, uh, um, I hope, is going to do an anthology of that book, but her last book was Demeter Goes Skydiving, which was great fun, exploring all the different dimensions of the goddess Demeter going skydiving in various dimensions. And uh, I will now read my blurb. The Disarmed Heart by Susan McCaslin traces an electrifying arc from the poet's sensory experience through to an embodied though elusive language and on to ecstasis. McCaslin brings us to the place of direct perception where language is formed into a poetry that engages mind, heart, with all the senses. So, welcome back to London. Susan McCaslin. Thank you, Penn, and, and I want to thank Stan and all the people associated with this, uh, this reading series, this open mic series, and this is the liveliest and fullest audience I've had on my tour, so I'm, um, Lee and I are delighted uh, to be here. And I also want, come on in, uh, just want to say that uh, I feel, as Lee was reading, our, our work resonates together um, because I think we both um, are looking at that pivotal point between the temporal and the eternal and uh, the count flow and counterflow of the two. That phrase kept uh, coming back to me from Lee's work. And uh, we're both interested in nature, so I'm going to begin with a, an ode uh, from the first section of the book called Open Odes. And I use the exalted form of the, the ode, the address, the direct address to something in nature or a person or, um, or whatever um, that can sound ecstatic and is. <laughs> and it's not too fashionable to use the O, O, U, you know. Um, so I'm trying to contemporize that. And uh, 
not not be afraid of it, uh, that it sounds old fashioned. So this one is about a, a, a pair of, of deer that came up from the ravine uh, of our, our, our home. Uh, there's a ravine that uh, our house backs onto a beautiful ravine with big um, cedar trees and fir trees and, and, uh, that rise up. So when we look out in the backyard, we see kind of a rainforest. We're very fortunate. Oh dear, not D-E-A-R. <laughs> oh dear, such arduous partners, twin apparitions rising softly from the ravine. Spots on your back evaporate into stars. Silent seraphs lodge in your throats. You are neither messages nor ciphers. What can we say? except that you appear rather than arrive from the woods behind our house, that your eyes trace us, trance us into themes of soft hooves, and that vanishingly you earth us into dream presence. And this, um, we have pileated woodpeckers um, uh, on our, our property in our area. Do, do you have that species yeah. here? Yes. 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 yes, well, this is a pair of pileated woodpeckers. Oh, pileated woodpeckers. Woody woodpecker made a travesty of you. Cartoon cutesiness mocking your rare air. Wind riffles vermilion crests. White bands gleam along your necks, jackhammering our backyard maple snag. You, Rosie the Riveters, fling chips. Fledglings sleep in an interior labyrinth, drummed from broadleaf maple's core. Your drillings carve happy homes for smaller species moving in later. Sign over the doorway, construction done, put up your feet and have a brewski. Twin shamans, mated for life, your monogamy, a foil for all our inconstancies. <laughs> this one, um, Penn mentioned the Han Shan Poetry Initiative, um, this effort to, uh, successful effort to save a 25 acre, uh, uh, not old growth, but moving toward old growth uh, rainforest, uh, about uh, a kilometer from our home along the Fraser River. And I have a number of odes addressed to trees in this forest. Uh, but I'm going to read the poem uh, about Han Shan uh, because Han Shan, uh, as we were strategizing for how to um, draw in uh, media interest, I guess we were being pragmatic uh, into um, you know, public support for saving this forest. I thought of this ancient uh, Chinese poet Han Shan that I studied in university, a sort of 6th century BC uh, hermit poet monk who lived in, on Han Shan Mountain and scribbled his poems on rocks and was said to have uh, written poems on trees. So I invited poets from all over Canada and beyond to submit tree poems. Um, and we suspended them from trees and hung them in the forest for two months. And it was, I called it the forest anthology or the forest installation. And then they were removed. But, uh, and there will be an anthology pen. Uh, I'll tell you about that later. Oh Han Shan, zesty poet monk, time warps from China to rural BC. Action rouser hangs hermit thoughts on western red cedar. Planet's big climate shapers fur, black, cottonwood, spray spritzers in our mouths. Old Han Shan, more sprightly than a teen, drops rhyme on twigs. Words rare as Pacific water shrew ascend a mushroom stair. Leaves, trills, dangle verbs, ephemeral decorations, elaborations scrawled on deep time rocks. 
and that forest does contain uh, some uh, species at risk. So that was part of the argument that we were able to make, getting wildlife biologists to come in and write up reports. This next section is called the disarmed heart, and I put a lot of my uh, anti-war or uh, and peace poems into this this section. This one's called deploying verbs. Troops are seldom sent, but deployed. So I deploy these lobbing verbs your way. Their non-coercive weight longs to persuade your heart to keep on peacemaking. Recreate yourself daily. Hum, die, throb into more harmonious interludes. Plunge tripping harmonics. Be that clear-eyed harmonia, daughter of Aries and Aphrodite, whose parents' discord bred but another pink petal on the bow of her bloom. And this one is um, a form poem. Lee does a lot of, uh, as you saw, metrical and, and uh, form poems, and um, works with symbolic forms. And this is a glossa, which um, was inspired by P.K.'s pa Page's work in the glossa form in her volume called Holo Hologram. And um, it's based on lines from P.K.'s Page's poem, The Understatement, which I'll read first. And then what, what Atlosa does is embed the lines from the inspiring poet into the lines of the poem. When the stones rise, PK page, I speak not in hyperbole. I speak true words muted to their undertone, choosing a pebble where you would a stone projecting pebbles to immensity. You thought about the nested worlds, but wanted more to see, hear, touch, to be, if only moment-wise, earth music. Since a single phrase can make a maelstrom of the heart, empty the stony self into the sea or dust pool where the open eye, wry enchanted, voids the void, gazing and gazing. Clarity, I speak not in hyperbole. You speak in gardens, seeding blooms of sleep, where primrose disarranges time. The wild musk rose, aromatic hush, stirs a geometry of hearts. This earthly paradise inverting cone, mountain, hut or vortex overturned, a sentence slides across bone. I speak in true words muted to their undertone. Something prefers the minuscule, pattern in broken pattern, something whole, lingering, who knows? Adults look twice at an infant on the lawn remembering things lost, things round in the palm. When the body knew most everything, something shaped to the hand, something on loan, you want no flying bolt or bomb, but vibrating signature of rock, earth token, living koan, choosing a pebble where you would a stone. Now all is particular Articulate what the eye sees through you and you through the eye, unknown, a laser sharpening, dissolved. These bright periwinkles under the window, on their exact color, our words may not agree. Yet outside, rough bark of drafty Douglas fir conceals a Persian miniature, secret calligraphy etched into bark. Distilling words, you open each sound free, projecting pebbles to immensity. <laughs> Nothing like, uh, you know, entering into, when you enter into a glossa, you enter the 
the consciousness of the poet as they created the poem, and it's an energy field. It's it's a remarkable thing to try, and and there's a certain rules about it. I didn't observe the metrical pattern perfectly, but I did the rhyme, and you can do variations on the glossa. Um, so it's, it's I got my students to write them in creative my creative writing workshop, and I had some tremendous results. This one is dedicated to my dear friend, Penn Kemp. <laughs> and it was written when she was struggling with uh, a health issue, which I hope is resolved, but we'll talk about that later. I think it is, so. A novena for a pen. Nine muses blow in on long lineage lines on nine successive nights, rolled like star-covered eggs into your bloodstream, smithereening kidney stones. Nine Marys number rosary beads up and down your spine, pondering how pain becomes dream-drawn, deep matter of the heart, carmine transformed. You ask no special graces, but desire only the general rising of the all into the all, your conduit steady, a complete consort. And, uh, Penn and I did readings together in, in BC uh, a few years ago, so was, I'll tell you about that a bit later. Now this one is a, a rather different poem. Um, I won't spend too long setting it up, but what I'm doing is kind of playing with the different, what are called tropes, um, things like metaphor, simile, uh, personification that any English teacher would have to teach in a first year lit course. And I had to teach them for years when I was teaching poetry. And I started to think about the ontological, which has a sense of being, uh, principles behind these uh, common figures of speech. And I sort of played with them in little prose, par prose poem paragraphs. It's called Mystical Poetics. English teacherly tropes rise in the choir and start singing. So I sign up for a crash course in the metaphysics of metaphor, ontology of oxymoron, image, imago, icon, presence, turns in its sleep pause before it and be changed. Sophia, goddess of wisdom with her streaming hair. Simile, I want to say just smile. We are alike, this, like that, so near yet not, you and me and the universe, such a Marx Brothers team. Metaphor, simple things more than they seem this and that resonant each to each, shaking of Indra's net here, a tremor over there, deep ecology. Symbol, that which is tossed to the cosmos. This is me and not me, always more than itself. Things bouncing, rebound, dust on hallucinogens. Illusion, allusion. Past pirouettes into present. All stations here now. Sitting on rung three, the whole ladder rises a notch or two. How did that happen, Jacob? Personification. Everything up close and personal. What's so pathetic about the pathetic fallacy? Aliveness jives, dear son grins, I swear. Oxymoron, one as two in a third, ancient Looney Tunes math. Contradiction becomes the electra, conjunctio oppositorum, fly me to the non-dual. Synetici. Microcosm in macrocosm and the reverse. Minuscule seed mirroring, marrying that cedar. You, my archive, I, your text message, 
kiss, kiss. Metonymy. I'm more than my attributes, but my attributes are me. Cupid's bow conjures Cupid. Dizzying lad with his juicy arrows. Ping, pang. Hyperbole. Everything longs, elongates. Give me that big immaterial parcel containing all bits and bites of holy matter. Quick, I need deep time quickening, not the quick fix. Synesthesia. Wording, sounding, tasting, seeing, touching, hearing. One minuet. This purity of admixture. Dazzling adulteration. Ear rinsed in a sapphire wind. Alliteration. Chant of ritual sounds. Pattern pitter-patter in the oral oral realm. Scampering along the spine of the world. Assonance. All the wild vowels. Om of the overheard. Hush, rapture. Moans and alleluias falling. Consonance. Constancy, divine glue. The word as flesh in consonants wrapping and wrapped in phrases. Do the consonantal, the dance of love. <laughs> and the last one, caesura. Gravid silence. Hush at the thermals of speech base of the uttermost, words listing, listening, through words that know their places as they fall. Thank you for that one. Um, I have to review some of your terms and go back to English 101, but I, I tried to clarify from the context what the various metaphors are, but a lot of you are pretty, uh, you're poets yourselves, I'm sure, so. Uh, I had fun with that one. And this one is based on a dream experience that I had. Uh, and um, I went into my closet and all my clothes were alive. And I think the poem is self-explanatory. It's called Living Clothes. It's ordinary time. I'm roused by, by my alarm, but not fully awake. The white door of the closet opens, and behold, believe me, behold, is the word. A congregation of shimmering sheaths, living garments flowing, singing, dancing, weaving, shining. Kundalini earth fires yearning to move up the spine. Be become the body and extensions of the body. Transparent wings in chartreuse, magenta, Rose, Prussian blue, orchid, lavender, sea green fuchsia, blush, raw sienna, burnt orange, plum, and scarlet. Darling, I'm in the crayon box alive, and all the colors have birthed distilled honey, wine. Goddess, I'm blushing. This unified coronation dons the aquamarine swirling skirt, which falls over my head twirls like a carousel and plunges into breath this only ever now. And I'm going to um, finish with the last poem in the book and then read one poem, uh, a special extra poem that I'll tell you about in a minute. It's very short. It's called Refirings. In imagination's fuse rest a longer fuse, another firing. Let imagination bolster my meager flare, always falling back into the arms of fire. Thank you. And, uh, this is the bonus poem for the night. Uh, how many of you have seen this book? Um, this is uh, Penn Kemp's uh, edition of Jack Layton Art in Action which is a collection of reflections on, on Jack Layton's life and contribution from a wide variety of artists, politicians, thinkers, uh, people from all walks of life who were uh, moved by 
or influenced by Jack or um, wanted to honor his legacy in some way. And Penn was uh, kind enough to invite me to contribute to this anthology, and she's going to be doing some, some, something with it soon, right? I'll dress. You can come up and talk to me about that. We haven't had time to connect on that. But um, I'm sure you can approach Penn about it. And uh, I wrote another a glossa. I was uh, involved in glosses at the time. It was the same time I wrote the glossa I read for you. But this is a, a glossa for um, Jack Layton. And at the end of each stanza is a, a line from Jack's famous, uh, well-known now, letter to the public just before he died. And I think you, some of you, many of you will recognize Jack's lines. It's called Polis Rising, a glossa for Jack. It's hard, dear Jack, to be optimistic without you. I call you dear, though we never met. Yet for decades I eyed your steady trajectory, admired a public man speaking for ordinary Canadians, passionate while I wrote and rewrote the same slippery poem that faded, returned, and would linger. You arching past me with your bright demeanor, so much my opposite, extrovert to my introvert. Yet we meet now at Candle's Wick where friends hunger, knowing love is better than anger. You made politics into poetry, the polis, a grand room with room for dif disenfranchised voices, brought us to our intimate othered kin. At the end, cancer magnified you, your waving crutch a semaphore for compassion. When you rallied and sunk in your last year, you embodied something stronger than yourself, your courage teaching what we've always known, that hate is not love's opposite, but fear, that's clear, and hope is better than fear. In the museums, there are corridors of defaced marble, since to attack the arts is to grab at a culture's jugular. No arts, no blood, no bones, no health. The arts, not mere concoctions, not options, but another kind of food for the brood. Shelter and daily bread, soul food and spirit care. What are we if not creatives creating? Making, dreaming, spinning, elating. You called us to an adventure in making, a dare, saying, Optimism is better than despair. I used to think being optimistic was Pollyanna-ish, but in you I found something other than the naive, a relentless restlessness that rests only in joy and fullness and fulfillment, a wild yes saying that takes up and includes all our divine darknesses. To be other than this hopeful is atavistic, since this is how evolution itself evolves. When you left, you left a rarity, legacy of surprise. Ah, we are not one, not atomistic. So let us be loving, hopeful, and optimistic. Thank you very much. And I think the first thing in poetry is that kind of qualitative attention to what's going on around you. Uh, as, as I've matured, I think, as a writer, I used to be very much, um, you know, an indoor person, a scholar, 